Poaching has become more intense and deadly. In the last 18 months, with the eyes of the world's media on domestic issues, poachers in Africa have developed horrifying new methods. As long as the market is there, there will be poaching. And what is happening now already is, is that guys hunt these, these uh, rhino with, with high caliber uh, guns. But they are now starting to poison water with a, with a poison which we call two-step. It comes from that if, if a dog gets in as much as a match head of that poison, it takes two steps and dies. So now they poison water holes and animals die there, uh, and specifically where rhino and elephant go to drink, so that they then have access to the horn and they have access to the, to the ivory. If an animal grows an ivory tusk or a horn on the end of its nose, there are criminal gangs that want it dead. Poachers are killing unprotected rhinos wherever they find them. The problem makes headline news all over the world. Well-meaning pundits offer solutions, yet rhino species everywhere are in terminal decline. If trade was legalized, if we could meet or try and meet the demand from China, there's a good chance this animal would still be walking here today. Correct. Very good chance. I would be able to afford the kind of security and fencing and stuff that would keep would have kept them out and she would have been alive. Solutions to poaching of rhinos and elephants touted by governments and Western animal rights groups, such as burning confiscated ivory, are short-sighted, say wildlife managers. When they first started burning ivory, Richard Leakey and I shared a public platform in Johannesburg. I think it was 1993. And I said to him, whoa, you've just burnt a lot of ivory in Kenya. Now, how can you justify burning ivory when we are on our hands and knees to the people in the West and saying to them, please, Africa needs donations. He said that the Americans said to him, we want you to burn it. If you can make a big spectacle, where you can burn this ivory, then the whole world be in, will, will be incentivized to, to back CITES when it says they're, they're going to ban the ivory trade and the elephant will be declared an endangered species. I know the Kenyans have been bought into doing such silly things. You know that they are 100% funded from outside by animal rights groups, their Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. So that's how they do it to you. They frustrate you to the extent that you can't use your resources, then they start telling you we can burn them and then we pay you money. And in burning that, they will go back to their European constituents saying, we have achieved uh, to stop trade in rhino horn and in ivory, it's victory, can you donate money? So they're getting a lot of money out of it, more than they will even compensate Africans for doing that. So it's an anti-use agenda and we'll never accept it in Africa. The problem is in the regulation of rhino horn and elephant ivory. The prohibition on rhino horn makes it reputably more valuable than gold. And just like whiskey in 1930s Chicago, the only people making money out of it are the criminals. Who the poachers are in Africa? And it's not the poor little village hunter. I'll tell you it's not, it's the politicians. Whatever the syndicates are doing with the rhino horn, whether they're stockpiling it or whether they're selling it. The route apparently now is through Taiwan. doesn't matter. The point is there's a market. Now, you live next to the Kruger National Park in Mozambique on the eastern border of Kruger National Park. Eight years ago, all the villagers there, the houses were out of, made out of reeds, the roofs were out of reeds, the lot. Now, if you take an aerial photo of those villages, all the houses are built out of bricks. They all got zinc roofs and there are trucks standing outside the houses. And that's not because all of a sudden they got more crops to sell or more cattle to sell. It comes from the poaching of rhino inside the Kruger National Park. You must understand that, that being caught is one thing. You, you, if they catch you and they put you in jail, you sit there for 18 months and then you get out. Wildlife managers say what African countries should do with the rhino horn and ivory trade is what America did to the trade in alcohol. Don't ban it, regulate it. Allow the trade under strict rules and earn tax dollars from it. Despite what CITES says, elephants are far from endangered in many parts of southern Africa. Selling their ivory could produce much needed money for conservation and development. Because we are being told we cannot sell ivory 
to make money to pay for the culling they have to do to manage the elephants, to get them the population reduced to the size that it should be. We say, well, can't, we've got all these stockpiles. The Zimbabwe stockpile of ivory is huge. The house that I live in here, it would fill it twice over to the ceiling, every room in the house with tusks. Huge, huge amounts. They're not being killed. They've been, they've been sitting, that ivory's been sitting there for years. They're not allowed to sell it because CITES says that every time they issue a permit to any sovereign state to sell a small group of ivory, of ivory tusks, there is a spike. There's a spike in the ivory poaching. At the same time, rhinos can be farmed and their horns harvested since those horns grow back. Africans use their resources. They never burn them to be paid for destroying them. That is against the values of uh, sustainable use. Uh, as we are saying that even with the rhino horn, you know, you can use it sustainably. The legal position of rhino horn is the subject of battles between different jurisdictions. CITES allows trade in horn from rhinos kept in reservations. South Africa banned the trade in rhino horn in 2009. The country's constitutional court recently backed domestic trade. And now South African politicians may be about to bring in new rules restricting it again. Meanwhile, rhinos are becoming fewer all the time. Southern white rhino numbers in Kruger, South Africa's biggest park, are down to a few thousand. The government says it doesn't have an exact number. Poachers are encroaching on private land, home to 70% of the white rhinos left. If governments in the West allowed horn harvesting, this would not be happening. Their reason seems cosmetic. When the tourists come, they want to see the rhino with his horn in Kruger. So if, if the horn is not there, it's, not, it's like they're not seeing the right rhino. But if, if the tourists were educated to say that the rhino is now going to be seen with a shorter chunk of its horn because we're harvesting, uh, then they would understand and appreciate that. It's the problem is that we inherited the same colonial way of doing things uh, to say wildlife is just for scientific management. We cannot start having someone who is in charge of running a marketing uh, department to sell the horn. Which the people buy in China or in the Eastern countries. It's, it's, it's really got nothing to do with how you and I think about that. It's how those people that use it think about it. And for us to say that they're wrong, come on, Ben. Then, then we must say the Pope is wrong. Uh, I, I mean, who are we to say that they're wrong? Uh, th then the Pope must be wrong, and, and then Islam must be wrong, and, and, and Buddhism must be wrong. Uh, so it's very, very relative. And it seems to me as if people are not prepared to understand that, that the value judgment about these things sitting in America and in Europe is not the world's value judgment. The absolute majority of people sit in the East of the world. And we should actually be living according to their value and not the European value. When Elliot Ness and his team of untouchables busted a whiskey shipment, Al Capone simply made more whiskey. It's not the same with rhinos. They don't grow like barley. Without a sensible new system to harvest rhino horns, their future looks bleak.